everybody, welcome to Capital Combat. The name says it all. I'm Hakeem Branch. Rob Jarrell. And today we're going to do our full recap on the Saul Alvarez Amir Khan pay-per-view event. You've probably seen Rob do a, uh, his initial recap right after the fight. Now we're going to really break down and tell you what we saw in the fight and what happened to lead up to that and, you know, our usual recap stuff. Mm -hmm. So. We're going to go in chronological order of the card. A lot of people got knocked out. It was pretty entertaining uh, all together. So we're going to start with Tashir and Stevens. Take away, Rob. Knockout. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, Curtis Stevens is back in the mix. Like he said in the uh, post-fight interview, he had a, uh, a young lion trying to take out the old lion. And the young lion found out that the old lion had a little bit more bite left. Uh, from what I saw, this was my first time seeing Teixeira. He had a pretty glossy record. He was undefeated, mm -hmm. had a high knockout ratio. But he looked painfully slow in there against Stevens. And that's one of those things that we mentioned um, of the pedigree and the different, not even in the, just the U.S., but the pedigree between some countries. We know Brazil is, when it comes to sports, Soccer is the main thing down there, but yeah. boxing. There have been some decent boxers out of that out of that country, but they just don't have the sparring or the resources dedicated to boxing and yeah. and and really the the knowledge base that they have here in the states or in England, Mexico, etc. Yeah, so they are they are football, football, and uh, mm -hmm. BJJ. Other than that, good luck. Mm -hmm. So Stevens got himself back on the radar. Maybe even back in the title picture, like if he gets like one more good win, mm -hmm. he might even get a rematch with Triple G. Maybe he could fight Lemieux, who also fought on the uh, card. I think we'll that's that later. I think that's who he wants to fight. Lemieux. Yeah, I think he wants the. Uh, did they fight before? No, they have not fought. Then I think he actually wants a match with Lemieux, who wants a rematch with Golub. Golub, yeah. yeah. All right, so we'll see what happens with that. Next up. Frankie Gomez, Mauricio Herrera. This fight was at 147, which mm -hmm. um, kind of surprised me because Herrera is a 140 pounder uh, for most of his career. And it showed on fight night. Uh, he was also off for almost a year. I think his last fight was against Hank Lundy, it was. which ended early mm -hmm. because of a headbutt. So he didn't get much work in on that. And then he's been sitting on the shelf moved up to a new weight class so he had a bigger younger sharper fighter and it was all bad for him yeah moving up he didn't he didn't seem quite as energetic and he it's not that he's a high energy guy but you could tell the difference in his movement kind of in appearance with the weight so that just kind of fell into frankie gomez's hands he was able to learn, uh, land a crisper faster punches and movement was a big thing we know herrera has decent movement, but Frankie Gomez was able to land, um, I want to say, kind of a, a, a overhand right and then move immediately to his left, um, which was, which almost landed like clockwork. You can actually see Herrera's face, and I thought that was good showing. And like I said in the big, uh, preview, I thought this fight would get him to start fighting those 15 top 15 fighters at 147. So it'd be interesting to see where he goes from here. Maybe he'll take on someone. Um, that also is undefeated or may have one loss, but still in that uh, the higher higher rankings. Yeah, uh, he's with Golden Boy. We'll see what they got for him. They do have a lot of good fighters. So, next fight, we got David Lemieux, Glenn Tapia. This was first, Glenn Tapia's first fight at 160 pounds. I don't know who decided to let him fight his first fight at 160 pounds against David Lemieux. This was a bad idea from the start. Tappy has already been knocked out twice at 54. Mm -hmm. Then you move him up in weight and put him in with the second biggest puncher in the division. Somebody needs to be fired. As for the fight itself, he started out well, mm -hmm. moving well, pumping the jab. Unfortunately, it had nothing on it. And Lemieux said, Kill. He went straight to him, landed hellacious hooks, uppercuts. 
I mean, he worked them over with that left hand. Jabs, hooks to the body. I mean, they, they were vicious. And he broke Glenn down very quickly. Mm -hmm. And for someone who had, even though he's been knocked out twice, he had never actually been down. That changed. Yep. Uh, and as soon as he went down, his corner stopped the fight. Now, a lot of people are like, they are a little upset that they stopped the fight. They think they stopped it too early. But one, they know they're a fighter. Mm -hmm. And two, he was never, there was never really, I think he landed one good punch the whole fight. It was not going to get any better for him. I think they did the right thing. Yeah. That fight, you could tell that he, I don't know if it's, you know, some fighters come out, they look good. You know, he had the muscular, chiseled body, but the thing about it is you could tell he was stiff, very little fluidity in his punches and his movements, and almost no speed. And a guy like Lemieux, like you had no speed against a guy like Lemieux. He, you could tell, see Lemieux had the energy, he kept coming forward, and, um, and he had a very good uh, variation of his punches. He would go upstairs, he would definitely land to the body quite a bit. Yes. And it was only a matter of time. I'm surprised that he lasted as long as he did. I thought he was going down in like the second round. I was like, I'd be surprised if he makes a pass four. Um, I thought I personally would have given him the rest of the round myself, but he was, it was only going to get worse um, because he was starting to like really be broken down and those shots to the body were just taking his legs away. And we talked about it uh, on the phone after the fight, but uh, Rob was saying that he thinks he should go with like a more defensive-minded coach. No, it's not, a, not defensive minded, just you gotta take, there's something not right about him. It's, it's not, I don't think he has good defensive reflexes at all, but you, I don't think being with Freddie Roach in your defense, you have deficiencies in your defense is a good thing. Yeah, and, and being that it's this late in the game, he's probably not going to get any better defensively. So it's probably best that, one, they stop their fight early, and two, he should probably think about another profession. And that's because if he's going to be at 160 with bigger guys, and a lot of them can punch, and he's already been stopped three times, and all of his losses are by mm -hmm. stoppage, it's only gonna get worse, and then you're thinking about his post-boxing life. Mm -hmm. Whereas you don't want this guy at 35, 40 years old slurring his speech and having memory loss, you know, having a CTE signs like a football player or other older boxers. That's right. So I think that's what they were thinking about when they stopped that fight. And uh, I did see a headline of Freddie Roach saying that he thinks that Tapia should hang him up, and I agree with that. So, main event time. Amir King Khan stepping up eight pounds, two divisions, to fight the middleweight. Lineal middleweight. <laughs> yes. And Saul Canelo Alvarez. And if you saw our preview video, we uh we did two. They were linked together. Mm-hmm. Rob pretty much laid out the plan for what Amir Khan needed to do be, to be successful, which he did for the most part. But both of us said he would only be prolonging the inevitable because we all knew that Alvarez really only needed to land one shot to get his job done. Mm -hmm. Now, in, in the preview that I did, I said that I did not think that he would knock him out like flush with a 10 count or like the way he did. I was thinking it'd be more like, you know, how it was with Danny Garcia and Bredis Prescott. Because Khan has a lot of heart. And even when he's hurt badly, he still manages to make it to his feet. Not this time. This time, he was out. He was out for a while. It was pretty bad. But on the technical side, there were a lot of things that Canelo Alvarez did exceptionally well that I was very impressed that he did in this fight you can tell he's grown since fighting he who shall not be named and Arizlandi Laura 
go ahead and take it away, Rob. All right, so I gave Khan the first two rounds because he came out, I he, he stayed on the inside, he used his speed to his advantage by moving laterally and in and out and not letting Canelo get too close. Um, and you can see, see Canelo was just trying to figure him out, just weather the storm because Khan did land some really good shots. Yeah, he landed a really great right hand in the first round. Mm -hmm. It kind of, uh, it didn't necessarily hurt Canelo, but he was like, okay, he's here to win. I got you. But the improving defense that we mentioned, you can see it started to come along and come along as the fight wore on. You see Canelo give him subtle head movements. You can see his uh, footwork getting in and out with very deliberate steps. And he was cutting off the ring. It was lovely. Um, and he also did the cutting off the ring without using a jab. Because when I was watching the fight, I was like, Canelo threw a damn jab. Jab, please. Mm -hmm. But all he was doing was stepping with Khan. And he was cutting the ring off. Which goes to show another fighter that shall not be named who blamed a arm injury on not being able to cut off the ring on another fighter who won't be named. And before we move on, check out our video about cutting off the ring. Yes, we do have a video that shows you how to do that in our technical toolbox series. Canelo Alvarez did it to a T. Mm -hmm. He stepped with Khan, he stepped on angles, and eventually Khan could not circle the way he could in the beginning of the fight. Canelo also worked very well to the body and he was missing a lot up top because he was trying to counter mm -hmm. Khan and Khan was doing the smart thing and uh, moving and getting out. But a couple of times he still had that old problem where his feet would come together when he threw his combinations mm -hmm. which opened him up to get a few left hand uh, left hook counters. He got hurt in, I think it was like the third or the fifth, the third or fourth round right. with a left hook. And Canelo began to get closer and closer with that right hand. Another beautiful thing he did was he was rolling with a lot of Amir Khan's punches. Meaning that when Khan would like touch Canelo's chin, he would turn his body with the punch to take off some of the force of the punch and come back with his own counters. That is a very old school move that I've only seen uh, Lamont Peterson and Tim Bradley. Tim Bradley does it and I think uh, Chocolatito. Yep. Those are like the only three guys that are doing it right now. And it's, uh, it's, it is, it's a hard skill to master, but showing also, he started doing pull counters. Yes something that a fighter that shall not be named used on him very frequently in their fight. But you also saw Canelo do that a few times in the Cotto fight. Mm -hmm. Yes. This guy is learning and getting better. That is a good thing. That's what we want out of fighters. And the last thing is just, just jab a little bit more. His jab is fast. It's sharp. When he did throw it, mm -hmm. it landed accurately. He just didn't do it. I think because he had knockout on his mind, he wasn't really thinking of using his jab. But if he uses his jab, like another certain middleweight contender who they're on a collision course to fight, he uses his jab to set up all of his other power punches. Yeah, that brings us to the sixth round where during that fight, what does Canelo do? He faints a jab to the body. And considering that he landed quite a few times to Khan's body, uh, was probably worried about it. Not only that, but he uses his arms and hands to block more than try to move or slip punches. So what does he do? He tries to parry the jab to the body, which was a feint. Which we also have done a video on as well. But for him, he did it with both hands. I'm not dropping both hands for nothing. He, he exactly. tried to do it with both hands and then come over the top with a left. Well, with that feint, Canelo was quicker. He throws that right, Good drops, night. and finishes Khan. Yes. We all knew that was coming eventually. But like I said earlier, I was incorrect in thinking that Khan would be able to get up and then Canelo would, you know, 
rain down more punishment and stop him. He only needed one punch. Mm -hmm. Which is to be expected. I think people are finally starting to see why we have weight classes and why moving up weight classes is so difficult. It's not as easy as people have made it look. Certain fighters throughout history have done it and it makes you appreciate how good they are mm -hmm. to have done that, especially those who have moved up several divisions or skipped divisions and been successful against top dogs in that division. It's not a game with the weight classes. Even in MMA, we had two big names find out real quick that moving up the weight class is not all it's cracked up to be. And especially on a short notice. You don't want to do it unless you are a special fighter. But you have to give props to Amir Khan because he feels that he's a special fighter. He dared to be great. And you hear that all the time. We want fighters to dare to be great. And then we have one that dares to be great. And everybody try to poop on him. Now we know Khan says some ridiculous stuff from time to time. But you have to give him a round of applause just because he took that chance yes. as a huge underdog yes, and actually came out until that punch had a pretty good showing of himself. Yes. So he's going back down to 147. Guys in his own weight class, guys who are moving up, guys who want some money, and fights that we want to see. Yes. And we hope that they get made. Yep. And as far as the middleweight title is concerned, we need to see Canelo on Triple G. That needs to happen. WBC already ordered 15 days to get it done. And I also saw that De La Hoya did call uh, K2. Mm -hmm. So hopefully they get something worked out. I know the weight is the biggest issue. But hopefully they come to an agreement so they can get that fight made. Let's do it at 157. Mm -hmm. Something. Yeah. 158 anything just just get the fight made that's right um with all of the improvements canelo has shown over his last few fights mm -hmm. it makes the fight a little bit more interesting as of now i still think triple g wins but it may be a little bit more competitive than say you know a few years ago and and that's a good thing not only do we want our fighters to step up we want them to be competitive as well so let's hope that the fight gets made. And if it does happen, it gets it's a competitive fight that we can all enjoy. And buy the pay-per-view when it comes out. That's right. Uh, I'm, I'm going to leave that alone. I'm not going to go into all that. That's it, guys. Thank you for watching. Make sure you hit us up on all the social networks. Facebook, Google+, Instagram, all that great stuff. Capital of Combat. And we'll see you in the next video. Peace. This is round one, and you've already lost. They don't seem to see that everything we've done is coming and gone. My fists are on fire. I perform till I perspire. My demons are in a rage. Keep thinking that it's a game. I kick rhyme, hurricane. I told them I don't play. I'm liquid. Black Street Fighter. Street Fighter.